Hi everyone, today is the day that we are going to introduce ARIMA models. So ARIMA is an acronym of Auto Regressive Integrated Moving Average. So these are one of the most popular methods out there for forecasting and the ideas are very simple and actually we are just building on top of ARIMA processes. So just a reminder, if you remember this Google stock market series, we had this idea that when we are dealing with the original series, we have something strange in the autocorrelation function. We have this, this kind of exponential decay, but this is an artifact of having a, a, an overall trend between the beginning and the end of the series. And if we take the derivative, the difference of the series, we have something which is pretty much like random noise. Okay, the idea of Harima is that we can combine differencing at different orders with autoregression and mover average. So the idea of the I is because integration is the reverse of differencing. So basically, the integrated signal is the original one, and by differencing, we are converting that signal into something which is stationary. So just as a reminder, remember this idea of the shift operator B. So this is the R RP process. Okay, we are doing this kind of regre linear regression with different lags at different times, from 1 to p, for instance. This is the moving average part, in which basically we are trying to correlate with the past history of the noise or the impulse. And this is a kind of bias, which is giving us a kind of mean value of the series. And now we're introducing this part. This d is the degree of the differences, and basically the idea is that we are trying to convert this into a stationary series. So for instance, if now we generate a new series, now we're going to introduce this differencing. So this series is going to have the autoregressive part of the process, the moving average part of the process. And remember that the order has to match the number of parameters that we are introducing in, the, in this function arima sim. And you can see that this is not just fluctuating. So there is an overall trend because somehow we have the integral of, of that. And the, par the integral part comes from the idea that the first derivative is stationary, so the integral is not. Just a couple of of uh, example, so when we take the first derivative, the difference, we are removing the linear trend, okay? This is, of course, something that we have to do after we have applied the Box-Cox transformation or whatever, okay? But the idea is that in the case of Google, uh, Google series, and in this case, you can see that we have an overall linear regression between time and series. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of expected that taking this first de de derivative is going to solve the problem. If we have something which is more quadratic, something like gross non-linearly, up and down, or we have a kind of valley in the series, probably difference in twice is going to remove this quadratic term. Okay, let's play a little bit with some real data. So these are five years from, let's say, mid-2015 to current day. And you can see that you can import data from, from the stock market using the Yahoo page. So this is a kind of tricky, but okay, you can copy and paste if you want to inspect different actions. So you can change EPEX here by Google or whatever. And this creates a list, and this list has some parameters inside. So the interested parameter is this EPEX adjusted, but you can also explore different, different parameters, different columns in this data sets. For instance, the, the value at the starting of the day or the, or the closing value and so on and so forth. So let's plot the data, the time series, and you see something like this. So again, you, we have these wigglings, ups and downs, and you can see that overall we have some decay trend. Okay, remember that this is from 2015 to now, probably this is COVID-19, okay, but you can see this overall trend. Of course, if you take a look at this, uh, the autocorrelation function, you can see that this, this decay is an artifact, so probably this is related to the trend, not related to, to the correlations itself, because this doesn't look very much correlated, so this looks like noise. On the other hand, if you take a look at the partial or correlation function, you only have one bar here. And that means that probably we have one element in the moving average. Okay, let's take the derivative, the simple difference, and here we go. So now you can see that everything is more or less between these dashed blue lines, meaning that we cannot distinguish between this and pure noise. We have some peak here, but probably this peak comes from these outliers that are messing up with the data. Okay, and, and, and for sure, this is COVID-19, and we don't know what is this, I, I should have to check the data, but probably this is related to something that happened in the, in the market. Probably, I know, the US elections, I don't know, something like that. And you can see that now, with this differencing and regarding these outliers, because these outliers are huge, so probably this is why we have this long-term correlation, everything up besides that is almost purely random noise because everything is contained in both graphs between the dashed blue lines. So you can see that taking the derivative, we have checked that that this com com completely, let's say, 
uh, weekly in series is more simple than that so this looks like there is a trend the market is going up and down and this looks like there is something related to politics or whatever but if you take a look at this this is pure noise with some rare events that we cannot explain okay so let me show you again the box jenkins methodology that we have covered before so now we have unveiled this part, which is taking the proper derivatives. So we can divide this methodology in three phases. The, fa the phase one is related to identification. So we have, we have to prepare the data. Of course, we have to transform the data. And by transforming the data, I mean using things like box cox transformation in order to remove the bias or the skewness in, in, in the series, but also taking derivatives. And derivatives are going to remove this overall trend. Now we have to do this part of model selection, and we're going to do this simply by examining the or correlation function and the partial or correlation function. And then we are now in phase two. We have to make some estimation, make some diagnostics, and then iterate on, until we are happy with the, with the resulting uh, model. Okay, and now, now we have a good model, we can, we can do forecasting. So basically, th these diagrams are the same, but you can see this like, I know, flowchart, or you can see this more easily in, in distinguishing three phases, okay? So prepare the data and start to look around, make some simple models and try to see if the models are good enough and then do some forecasting. So we've seen that just by taking one derivative or whatever, you can transform something that doesn't look very well in the autocorrelation function to something that looks pretty nice. But you can also do, can do this more automatically using these KPSS tests uh, after the names of the, the creators of the method probably uh, th this guy, this Russian guy did it before, but, but it's okay. So the idea is that you can do some kind of test and you, you, can, you have a p-value that you can use to compare. So in this case, you can run this using the, the function kpss and whenever you see something that is above 0.05, let's say, you can be pretty sure that no differencing is required. Okay, so if you take an ARMA 1 1 process, for instance, we know that this is not integrated because it's actually ARMA 101, then you can see that the test is working pretty well. But again, one of the messages of this course is that not, nothing trumps the human brain trying to decipher some patterns. Okay, finally, let's say, how can we can compare different models? Because you can see that our ARIMA is, is going to provide some algorithm, our visual method, our iterative method is going to provide another. So you can go back to this video and, and check some measures for accuracy, but we can translate some of them into this case. So we are going to play with our statistic, which remember, which is a kind of one minus the overall correlation, the adjuster R squared, which is something like that, but corrected by the number of parameters, and then AIC and Bayesian information criterion, which is something, again, that is related to minimizing the error in the prediction, penalizing by the number of parameters. Okay, again, you can go back to this video and learn more about them. Okay, we're going to use these ones, and, and actually we're going to explain a little bit auto ARIMA, which is this function behind this method. So now we are equipped to understand how our ARIMA works. Okay, this is also called the Heinemann conduct car algorithm. So the idea is the following. We're going to use the KPSS test in order to determine if at least up to, let's say, second order derivatives are required for the data. We are not going to use higher degrees because if you need actually to remove cubic uh, interpolation, probably these methods are not going to work. So it's pre preferable to go back to the composition methods or exponential smoothing methods. Okay, so this is the, the range of differences that we are going to try. And now that we have decided the value of D, we are going to use different values for the autoregressive part and the moving average part, okay? And now we are going to try different models. So the four initial models are uh, 0D0, 2D2, 1D0, and 0D1, and we are going to compare, okay? And we are going to calculate the archaic information criteria. And now we are going to iterate just by increasing plus and minus 1. So in the, in the first step, we are taking the, the best of these five models, okay? Including one with, with drift and without drift. And then we are in increasing by one, the first coefficient, the P, and the second coefficient, the Q. So you can see that this is not exhaustive. We are not trying all the possible models in the world. So we are like kind of first deciding D, then deciding a very simple model after that, and then increasing plus and minus one until we are happy with the model, okay? In the end, at these steps, we are not computing the AIC com uh, formula exactly because this involves calculating the residuals and, and performing this operation. And you can see that this operation is going to, I don't know, for 
big data data sets in which you can have millions of re registers this is going to be very expensive so sometimes you are not computing that but an approximated sample of that coefficient okay but now that you have this model that you can run the full algorithm in order to compute AIC okay so let's go back to the Spanish stock market so let's play again with this data set and now let's plot the data remember this is the original data this is something that wasn't right but we don't have to care about that if we are using the ROARIMA function you can see that the outcome of the function is going to be that the best model is 0, 1, 0. And that means that after taking the derivative, basically every, everything is pure noise. Okay, so this is something which is completely unpredictable. And actually, you still have these things that you can, and probably these are, I don't know, 10 or 6, um, maybe probably between 6 and 10 times the standard deviation of the previous series. So this is a rare event, also known as a black swan. Okay, if we take a look at uh, the zeros of the root, you can see that this is zero and zero, so we don't have any root of the, of the characteristic polynomial. That means that this process is pure noise. So we don't have to care about the stationarity because it's absolutely stationary and invertible. Okay, now let's, let's change a little bit the parameter. So instead of just calling our ARIMA, let's add this parameter, which is trace equals true. And now we can see the learning process. So you can see the this algorithm so first for by the kpss method it has decided that the first the best value for d is one and then it's trying this parameter when you have p equals two and q equals two the same with zero and then you can see that these are kind of diagonal and then this model in which we are by going back to zero but without drift and now we can add plus and minus one and you can see the comparing that this has the, the lowest value so here the value is 1289 this is more or less the same okay so th this is slightly smaller so we could actually choose to remove the drift so the drift is not important in this case and actually you can see that the standard error for the drift is 0.43 if you multiply this by 2 this is going to be larger than this one so that means that this coefficient is not statistically significant so we could remove the drift and and you could see that there is no difference there also, you can see that the final value of the AIC is not exactly this one. And this is because this is an approximate value, as I was saying, in, in the first step in the learning part of the Auro Arima, is computing just the error for, for a slight, uh, for, for a small part of the data set. Uh, this is not relevant for a small data set like the ones that we are playing with, but for big data, data sets is, is completely crucial. Another example, so let's take the excess mortality by any cost in Spain. You can actually download the, da the data in CSV, which is uncommon in, in the Spanish administration, but here is a good example, a good practice, okay? Uh, let's plot the data. This is 2019, this is 2020, you can see this is COVID-19. So this is the expected number of deaths during the last year, and this is the real, so, sorry, this is the, the real, uh, the, the number of deaths last year, and this is the number of deaths this year. You can see that something weird happened there. This is COVID-19, of course. And we can try to learn something from 2019 and see if we can extrapolate to 2020. And if you run out of Arima, you see something which is weird. So you need to go to, to degree three in the moving average and the autoregressive part. And that means that probably this is not learning very well. And actually, you can see that the standard errors are huge. So again, if you multiply this by two, this is even larger than this one. That means that this coefficient is not significant. This is not significant, not this one. This is a slightly significant, but not that much. And you can see that this feed is crap. Okay, why is that? Because it is probably is requiring using very large values of P and Q in order to capture all the data. You can see that the residuals are not even very good. So we still have some bars outside the dust blue lines. So basically, ARIMA is not working for this sort of data set. Why is that? Well, you can see that there are tons of models and almost all the models are, have this, provide the same values of AIC. So these are larger, like in this one and this one, but the rest of them are almost the same. So we cannot distinguish between the models and any model is going to perform poorly. Namely, you cannot explain mortality simply by taking a look at what has happened in the past few weeks. So mortality is something which is broader. You have seasonal from year to year events so this is not going to be captured by ARIMA models, okay? So remember this idea, ARIMA, how to ARIMA is not magical. ARIMA is not magical, so it depends on your data. And you, you again, compare mortality, for instance, in Madrid to this feed, this is real crap. So th th you're losing a lot of information using this feed. You can see that the correlation is actually the same if you have Q equals three or Q and P equals one. 
um, the correlation is the same, but the fit is not very good. So you can see that there are some non-linearities here that you are not capturing with our IMA models. Okay, and again, both values are comparable. So not always having these values matters. So sometimes simplicity matters the most. Okay, and why is that? I have a couple of theories. One theory is that we are not capturing the flu season, which is periodic every year. So we have this excess mortality by flu every winter. And the second thing is that you cannot predict mortality tomorrow, but what has happened yesterday or next week, but what's happened this week and last week. So mortality has to do with something that happens in, in human lives throughout the years. Okay, so probably whole winter methods work better than Arima methods in this case.